Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful to be back on stage five. And thank you very much to all of you for coming and joining our session, which is the penultimate session in our track, Cancel the Apocalypse. This track, Cancel the Apocalypse, is something that's very dear to the Republica program team. It's grown out of a long-lasting collaboration with some wonderful people, uh, including the community and makers of the Utopia Festival in Tel Aviv. And so we're very proud that we put this program together, and especially with the panel today and the four people that are about to join me up here on stage. We want to talk today about a new movement called solar punk and how we're trying to invent a more positive version of the future. Uh, perhaps you heard some of the keynotes in the last couple of stages on this topic asking the question why we always tend to think in dystopias and how we can get to formulating a more desirable version of the future. That's exactly what the people who are about to join me on stage have been doing in their research and their work. And so yeah, we're going to talk now about solar punk and going post post apocalyptic with four wonderful people. Let me introduce them to you. Andrew Hudson is a writer of speculative fiction, a thinker on climate, and a self-named solar punk. Welcome, Andrew. <laughs> Steve Lambert is an artist and activist, has worked in many countries all over the world with different kinds of people, all of the sort of intersection on topics of society, technology, theater, games, and culture. He's also the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Artistic Activism. He's going to be telling us a little bit more about his work there in a bit. <laughs> Mushan Zer Aviv is a designer, educator, and media activist based in Tel Aviv. He's also worked on different intersections of, like I said, design, interactive design, history, and the future. And he's developed very interesting formats that he's also going to be sharing with us on stage. Last but not least, Maya Indira Ganesh has been working also at the intersection of new media, digital technologies, gender and visual advocacy. She's um, worked with Tactical Technology Collective for a long time and she's now currently doing her doctor at the Lufinia University in Germany. Welcome, Maya. Her PhD, correctly. So we're gonna. This is gonna be the format for this uh, conversation. We're gonna have um, Andrew give us about a 10-minute input to start with. Then we're gonna join in discussion, giving all the other panelists a bit more um, of an opportunity to share the work that they've done that fits to this topic. We're gonna have an intervention by Maya, and then we're gonna con just continue our discussion. And we're really hoping that you're all gonna join in. Um, so um, about halfway through, latest, we want to open it for your questions and comments on this topic, so please be ready for that. And take the stage, Andrew. Hello, does this work? Hi. I have notes on a separate computer. So we'll see if I can dual wield this. Okay, uh, so my name is Andrew Hudson. These are some of the things that I get up to. Mostly, I'm a speculative fiction writer. Sometimes I call myself a climate fiction writer. I'm currently based out of Phoenix, Arizona at ASU, where I study at the School of Sustainability and collaborate with the Center for Science and the Imagination's Imaginary College. I've sort of found my way there by taking an interest in this emerging speculative movement called solar punk. Uh, so, what is solar punk? I'm going to talk about that today and just sort of set us off so that we can see how this can guide us into some post-post-apocalyptic types of thinking, which I think can take lots of literary and aesthetic forms beyond just solar punk. So uh, what solar punk? The punk kind of tips us off that we're talking about science fiction, right? Uh, solar punk follows in the tradition of cyberpunk, which was a movement starting in the 1980s to get sci-fi away from these relativity puzzles and galactic empires and time machines and wormholes and instead talk about the thing that was actually changing the world, which was computation. Uh, and cyberpunk, unlike a lot of movements in sci-fi, had this like really graspable, coherent aesthetic. Thanks to movies like Blade Runner. Oops. So that's, um, that's Neuromancer. That's Altered Carbon from Netflix this year. And, you know, Blade Runner is obviously pretty classic. Uh, cyberpunk wasn't just a can of stories and novels. It was fashion and design and look and an attitude, all of which was largely countercultural as the punk 
name implies. Uh, so everyone here can probably see cyberpunk in their head, right? And like, it's urban and grimy and neon and filled with these like, dangerous looking people with metal arms and VR glasses. <laughs> so there have been a lot of other punk genres, subgenres that take a line of technological speculation and spin it out into an aesthetic. So steampunk, you probably all know, uh, but there's atom punk and biopunk and diesel punk, but I don't think any of these quite cohered into a full-bodied movement the way solar punk seems to be doing. Uh, and I think solar punk, in a lot of ways, is a response to and a successor of cyberpunk. So cyberpunk is kind of, you know, it's about the information technology revolution, and solar punk is about the green technology revolution. Cyberpunk is dark and chrome and covered in latex. Solarpunk is sunny and leafy and dressed in like hemp canvas, right? Uh, cyberpunk is gritty, solarpunk is plucky. Cyberpunk explores the way technology can shove human life into ever greater levels of abstraction like cyberspace. Whereas I think solarpunk is really about tech that de-abstracts human relationships of material, material reality, meaning like health food and water, the climate, the land. So cyberpunks, they're out pirating data and uploading their brains into video games. Solarpunks are revitalizing watersheds, mapping radiation after disaster or war, and bringing back pollinator populations. And since all great speculative fiction is really not about the future, but about the present, cyberpunk is about the politics of the 1980s, right? It was about urban decay and corporate power and globalization. And the same way, solar punk is really about the politics of right now, which means it's about global social justice, the failures of late capitalism, and the climate crisis. So while cyberpunk started out as this literature that aspire, uh, inspired an aesthetic, I think solar punk really started out as an aesthetic that implied a lot of amazing untold stories. These were some of the images that were shared on Tumblr and what I sort of think of as one of the canonical founding posts of the solar punk movement by a user called Miss Olivia Louise. They look super colorful, inspired by Art Nouveau and Afrofuturism. It's full of greenery and stained glass and cultural diversity. The buildings all look really lived in, and but they're like happily graffiti versions of uh, all these like architectural renderings of hotels that have trees in the lobby that we see all the time. Um, and everyone is riding bikes and taking public transit because solar punk is not just about imagining a beautiful world, it's about imagining a world that can actually last. Uh, so that's where the solar comes in. These days I think uh, the most transformative technologies are the ones that move us towards a sustainable civilization. Solar energy is really the front of that pack, and that's not just me being self-serving, because I live in Arizona, where we get a lot of sun. Uh, solar has this colossal potential to improve our lives, and I think uh, it's a really profound shift to imagine a technological society that does not run on a scarce resource that's killing us, like fossil fuels, but that is powered by something abundant and free and life-giving like the sun. Uh, so this is a solar power installation in California. Uh, this is a panel from a comic book about Phoenix in 2045 that was put out by my friends and collaborators at the Center for Science and the Imagination. In the comic, uh, concentrated solar power plants like this one and also this one uh, had solved a big chunk of the energy problem, but now the heat it creates is killing birds, just like this one does, which is having negative impacts on the surrounding ecosystem. So there's a lot of potential drama in these renewable energy transformations. We'll have nuance we have to work out. And telling those stories is uh, one of the really interesting things that I think solar punk can do. Um, and solar punk can help us figure out how to make the world on the other side of the transformations meaningful and beautiful. Here's an image from my friends at the Land Art Generator Initiative. They have these awesome biannual design competitions for big pieces of public art that also generate renewable energy. So this is the kind of thing that uh, kind of, it's a big solar punk inspiration and the kind of thing that takes a lot of inspiration from solar punk. Um, 
So earlier this week, I participated in ASU's Solar Futures Hackathon. I sold this slide from Clark Miller, who helped organize that. Uh, we had four teams, and each team consisted of an engineer, a social scientist, an artist, and a sci-fi writer. Uh, we worked from a couple assigned variables uh, to that were mostly about the size and location of solar panels to imagine different sci-fi stories in which there's maybe seven or ten plus terawatts of photovoltaic power generation on the planet, which is about as much power as is used on the planet altogether. Um, so here's a bit of draft art that the artist in my group sketched on our first day. My team brainstormed the, a story about organizing for fair housing regulations in a future Detroit where this city-sized mega scaffolding had been put over the city and allowed people to uh, put solar panels and vertical farms in the sky space, kind of the, the airspace over their homes. So this is a really solar punk style story, right? It's got plucky characters fighting to improve a complex political situation in a visually compelling place. I think those are all good elements that you see a lot. No one shoots anyone else, spoiler. Um, and the sci-fi dream at stake is not like, let's live forever or let's conquer Mars. It's let's save the old woman's house uh, who wants to fill her sky space with handmade birdhouses, right? I was on the team, so obviously that's the kind of story that I wanted to tell, but I was really surprised and pleased to discover that uh, the other three groups were also telling really solar punk stories. Everyone was imagining communities of resistance where improving solar technology was not about higher efficiency and storage, uh, it was about better systems of generation that uh, were defined as better because they were more just and more free from exploitation and imperialism. And I think the, the reverse dynamic is true as well, right? A year ago, I saw Paul Hawken premiere his Drawdown book, really good, you guys should get it, uh, which quantifies solutions to our carbon waste problem. He argued that investing in education and reproductive health for women and girls would do more to stop climate change than investing in solar panels or wind turbines, right? Educating girls, it's right up there at the top. Uh, so solar punk has to be about that too. And in the context of apocalyptic predatory delay on climate change, on the one hand, and a lot of people wanting Elon Musk to own every rooftop in America, on the other hand, uh, that kind of politics is really countercultural. So that's why solar punk gets to be punk, even though it's not filled with like cyborg anti-heroes or a lot of people on drugs necessarily. Um, solar punk proposes that sustainable technology has a liberatory potential, that growing your own food and generating your own electricity can empower communities to fight back against the forces that would otherwise erase their self-determination and distinctiveness. I'm a white guy from the US, but a lot of the people most inspired by solar punk are those who see it as a genre that can tell their stories and give a sci-fi future to people who are non-white and non-Western, who are queer, who are disabled, who are indigenous, who are colonized. And I think that is why solar punk often, uh, more often than not, ends up being hopeful rather than apocalyptic and dystopian even though the stakes in the background are actually very apocalyptic in a lot of ways. As Naomi Klein pointed out in her uh, This Changes Everything book, the things we need to do to save the world from environmental disaster are also the things we need to do to build a world that is beautiful and healthy and prosperous and just and that we actually want to live in. So uh, Mushan, uh, talked about utopias and dystopias as attractors and repellers, right? Um, I want to add kind of a literary framing that I recently heard of that list. Diagnostic and curative. Fiction can give a name to some previously ineffable human experience uh, and can also help move us forward by providing a moral framework or resolving an internal contradiction. And I think uh, this distinction is really important because knowing what utopia might look like isn't enough to get us there. Just like your doctor showing you a picture of a really healthy person doesn't actually make you feel better. 
if we're going to cancel the apocalypse, we have to make some meaningful proposals of what we should do. Uh, so for me, solar punk says, okay, things are really bad. In some ways, things are worse than even cyberpunk predicted because climate change turns out to be an existential crisis and because the institutions that cyberpunk worried would take over the world did take over the world, but now they aren't even functioning very well. So let's give ourselves one out, one advantage, just something that we can work with, right? A tool that we can crack into these problems with. Abundant solar power, that's a good one. Uh, one, because that's what we'll need to capture and dispose of the 500 or so gigatons of carbon waste that we've dumped into our atmosphere. And two, because abundance is a paradigm that breaks people out of the zero sum thinking that makes uh, poverty and deprivation seem unavoidable. So let's imagine what it would look like if we made good choices and used that advantage to walk ourselves back from the edge of the cliff, healing the climate, dismantling oppression and ending the capitalist exploitation that got us into this mess in the first place. Uh, so, yeah, again, I'm Andrew Hudson. If you ever see a, fiction, a piece of fiction with my name on it, please read it. Uh, I'll leave it up to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Andrew, Andrew for that really nice introduction what solar pump means very inspiring before we kick off i just want to have a quick show of hands who here saw wendy chung's keynote on the first day <laughs> who saw steve's keynote yesterday a couple more i'm not going to ask you about mushans because he's speaking about something completely different today so <laughs> okay just to get a feeling in the room so wendy uh, I want to start with a general question to the panel and then give you a chance to speak a bit more about your work. Um, Wendy said something where I thought, yeah, hmm, that's actually quite obvious. Um, why, how, how are we supposed to develop a positive future if all of our visions of uh, digitization and society are based on dystopian science fiction of the 1980s? And it was like, mm, yeah, that makes sense, sort of. So I want to just openly ask you guys, why is it that we've been working with these dystopian versions of the future for so long? Why is it that the human mind tends to seem to develop more dystopian visions of the future rather than positive ones? Uh, yesterday in the keynote, I, I brought up an evolutionary argument in that uh, in order to, uh, the story I told is if we heard a rustle in the grass, and I was like, that's probably a saber-toothed tiger. We should get out of here. And we did that every time we would live. And if I was super chill and said, it's probably nothing. It's probably a bird or the wind. Um, I only have to be wrong one time. And I would be eaten, right? And so that all the super chill, relaxed ancestors were eaten. And we are the... <laughs> Uh, descendants of the paranoid and fearful, right? And this served us well for a long time, uh, but it doesn't serve us now. Um, it gets in the way of us. I mean, th also in our culture, there's a lot of rewards for pointing out problems, right? If you can point out problems and draw connections between them and study them in a way that no one has before, and speculate about other problems, like you'll be in the op-ed pages of newspapers, you'll uh, be written about as a, a great thinker, you'll be uh, you know, asked about your opinion, you, you'll publish books more easily. Um, so, sorry, Andrew. Um, <laughs> so we reward this, right? We think that is, that, that's insight, is to see how bad and explain how bad the problems are. Yeah, and I mean, fear is one of the driving forces in most political government narratives today, especially all governments. It works. Yeah, I, I think, though, that we're all pretty tired of the fear, right? I mean, and it doesn't actually show us a way out. Uh, you know, you're, you're all running in different directions. It doesn't coordinate you. I think you were making that point yesterday. Um, so having something else is, is really valuable. And as, yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> I think, and the, the other side of the argument is also true. Like, if you actually say what you think should be done, oh, yeah. you're really putting yourself on the line. Like, if you're saying we should do this, 
then then you're setting yourself, you're setting expectations and people are very concerned about that and then and then if if what you said should happen or what what you said we should do doesn't work exactly like you wanted it to work you're it's all your fault right <laughs> but but if you just said that this is a problem and it ends up not being a problem no problem that's good well and pointing it out is how, what helped us avoid it right like that you're given credit for h highlighting that hazard so everyone could work around it but i think talking about our dreams and hopes for the future like makes you sound like a dreamer um and that's n that's also not valued right it makes you vulnerable and also at present there seems to be very little in between i mean most there's, it's either this way or this way. So either you go to a tech event and everything is very dark and there's usually a bunch of activists terribly concerned about the very dark present, not just future that we're living in, which is surveyed and full of terrible IoT devices, etc. Or you go to a tech event which is super positivistic and celebrating all the pseudo amazing startups that they have on stage, but very, very little in between. Yeah, I mean, I think that both those things are are true, and I'm not going to go into the politics of sort of events and how they're set up, but it's true that, you know, those, those extremes are there. I think um, there's the evolutionary biology argument, uh, but there may, or that, that kind of approach to thinking about why we like to tell certain stories. I'm much more of a kind of political economy materialist activist, so I'm interested in who has the power to tell the stories and what kinds of stories are being told at different points in time. These are all very situated and very specific, and um, I'm pretty sure somebody's already looked into in the 70s, for example, or 80s, when a lot of these cyberpunk or dystopian narratives were being produced, what were the other, you know, five unpublished novels in the SF genre, for example? And if somebody knows about that, that paper which has looked at that, please talk about it. Otherwise, you know, there's a great digital humanities project out there for someone to do. Uh, so it's like, which stories get told? So for example, if you look at the, the literature and science fiction of, uh, of, of feminist SF writers, for example, maybe they were telling other kinds of stories. People like Octavia Butler, you know, who are not known for many years, and, um, and there are many others who continue to be. And I find in some of those stories, um, this kind of struggling with power and struggling with um, new and different changed realities. So maybe there are just other ways of telling the story and those were not amplified and they set the stage and, you know, yeah. genre. Let's get personal for a moment. When did you guys decide to tell the positive story? Were you all very concerned, dark thinkers, and there was a point that you said, no, I want to start working with utopias as a method, working with a, I like that you called solar punk a movement and not a genre. So this sort of empowering feeling that you're a part of actually doing something. Yeah, I, I use the word movement because I actually think there's way more people doing solar punk than writing it, uh, which is really eerie for me as a science fiction writer to constantly hear from people who are like, oh yeah, that, that stuff you're describing is what we're actually doing, where we've like dropped out and made our permaculture commune, and we've, uh, we're, we're creating maker spaces that are totally transformative. And so, um, yeah, I, I think mo like movement is a much better word because it encompasses activism and political demands beyond, and not just art. Yeah, for, for me, for me, it has to do with living in Tel Aviv, uh, which happens to be in Israel, uh, which happens to be um, not the most hopeful place in the world right now. And, you know, you can put it aside t for some time, but then I also have a son, and my son is seven years old, which means in 11 years, he's supposed to be drafted. So I have a timeline to work with. Um, that's the way I see it, and and it became really, really depressing for me. Like it, it, it made me feel like I I see no prospect, no no positive prospect for the future. Mm -hmm. And I love Tel Aviv, and I love my son, and I love my friends and my life and my family where I live. But I'm but I also know that the state of this country and the state of the occupation and the state of so many things that are happening in Israel are just unsustainable. So 
it's, it's either that I resign from everything that I know, or I actually shift the way that I think. And for me, it's like the, the, the idea of, of going beyond that, um, that depression is existential. Like it's really, I, I, th I also think it's a matter of humility. I, I think there's something uh, very pretentious about being so depressed. Yeah. L like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, there's so many options. We, and we need to, to kind of embrace them and, and be a, a bit more humble and understand that the future is not written. The f it's not like it's written and you just, you know, drift towards it. You actually make it. Uh, I, just a, a, a defense of depression really quick. Um, <laughs> I think one of the reasons people are uh, reluctant to imagine these futures is because if you really do and you vividly, you know, paint a picture in your mind of the world that you want, it is, it is in such contrast to the world that we're in now and, and to know how big that gap is. You know, I think like there is some comfort in not really being able to imagine how good it could be, <laughs> right? So there's that part and I think that we protect ourselves sometimes. Um, but the, the way that I got into this is not, you have a very specific situation, I'm really glad you said that. Um, but for me it was watching audiences, and I know you do this too. Um, and audiences don't respond to, uh, I mean I actually think it's kind of insulting to be like, do you know how bad it is? <laughs> like, have, do you even realize, like let me show you the data just on how bad it is, because I don't think you know. And then the idea is that once you know, that the, the reason you're not active is because you don't, you don't know. And if you did know these things, then you would be motivated. And when you're not motivated after you learn, it's because there's something wrong with you. You're, you're a bad person, you're uneducated, right? And then this is how activists get bitter, is they start to resent the people that they're trying to change for not having this enlightenment uh, revelation that turns them into a force, right? But what does motivate them? The possibility, the f it's what's motivating you, right? Steve, hey, you can clap. Uh, I think for me, I, yes, I worked in technology and information activism for a long time and I still continue to be that person, but I think that an experience of growing up with kind of like fragility every day when you know that um, things kind of turn on a dime. I mean, I actually grew up in a place where there was a wall. Uh, one side of the wall was the very kind of um, comfortable, academic, um, fairly cosmopolitan small town in South India and uh, it was an academic university town and uh, like right on the other side of the wall were all of the people who worked in our homes and lived in poverty and they were part of community health projects that the hospital did and um, you went to the same school and you had the same experiences of people on the other side of the wall but they were, I mean in school you had the same experiences but they were different and you could see how uh, I think when things are fragile you kind of can't let go and I think that resonates with what you're saying and so I think that's always been there for me and uh, recently I think my work has sort of turned more to the urgency of what does it mean to inhabit this planet and in a more sort of um, academic or um, intellectual sense and I'm quite happy for that and I will talk a little bit about those experiences later but I feel like um, something is coming back for me like how do you kind of sustain and work through living in fragility or with fragility? Yeah. Um, let me t dig a bit into your uh, workspaces because um, I was told, Steve, that at the Center for Artistic Activism, you're using Utopia as a tool, as a method in different workshops that you run. Can you tell us a little bit what that looks like? Yeah, so I, I would sort of say there's two parts. One is with the activists themselves or the artists. We work with activists and artists as like how to use um, this, what we call like a utopic visioning process for them to really get access to what they truly care about and why, what's motivating them, right? So one of the things that we'll do is we'll, there, we were working in South Texas and we were like, okay, what, what would be a win for you? Like, what would be success? And they're like, oh, you know, if we could pass state bill 17, that would be huge, right? And we're like, okay, imagine you pass that. What would you wanna do next? 
And they're like, <laughs> no. <laughs> right? And it's like they can barely imagine that. And I'm like, no, no, seriously, you, you did it. What would you want to do? And they're like, uh oh. Uh, well, we would need to enforce it. <laughs> right? It's just like the most minor, smallest steps. We're like, okay, you passed it, you enforced it, you're doing great. What would happen after that? And literally, they're like, um, I, can I pass? Like, <laughs> they, they're so, they're, they're so I, and you have to be, to be an effective activist, is like realize what the next step is and be fighting to get that. But as we pushed and pushed and pushed, right? It, actually, it's kind of funny. It is what so many people around the world describe is what you have shown in that solar punk vision. They describe a, a world that has this like lush green atmosphere. There's um, leisure outside. You can find kids playing and people are talking and communicating with each other and you smell great food. And it's like a beautiful vision of what they want, but they, they're not in touch with it, right? So part of it is getting them in touch with that and then learning how to use that to, to reach other people and then using that as a goal-setting process to figure out their plans. Yeah. Yeah, I, so that is totally the, the shared kind of utopian vision. And I think what's interesting about trying to approach it through a, a counterculture style genre like solar punk is say that like what's happening there is contested, right? And getting to it is contested. And it's not necessarily going to be uh, shared and and uh, equitable and and it, it can look really good, but it might not be good unless we have sort of adjusted our our social arrangements around that too. So um, sort of seeing through those visions into the actual debates that need to be had and the politics of it. And I. I I hope you're going to agree because I think it's like it's high time that um, this kind of idea starts becoming like more popular, talked about, propagated. I have them in the situation often where speaking about automation and the future of work and this sort of very dire pa picture of the future is painted where everybody's going to be enslaved by their robot boss and are all out of a job. It's basically either or. And, and whenever I try to sit there and go, but guys or girls, what about this idea that there could be a new sort of you know, this sort of rising of the arts and the humanities that we saw after the Industrial Revolution, perhaps there's an unleashment of creativity and, and sort of putting together our energies to create more beautiful things. And most of the time, especially, I mean, in Germany, you get a lot of people looking at you going, as if you're like the naivest person in the world. So I think this is something that's very, it's very powerful and very necessary. There, there's a lack of uh, imagination that goes along with that kind of disastrous thinking, because I would argue that Automation is only a problem like you're describing under capitalism. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a great sentence that was said by our closing keynote speaker of day one, Sasha Lobo, that a lot of the things we're blaming on digitization are actually problems of capitalism that we're blaming these digital technologies for. But yes, I think that deserves another round of applause. <laughs> Quote Sasha Lobo on it, not me, but I thought it was a, also that was an important sentence to say. Yeah. Mushan, you work also designing um, visions of the future. Um, I'd like to invite you to share a little bit about some of the methodologies that you've created. Um, I'm sure a lot of people, especially in this city, are, um, are um, experienced in the sort of historic touring that you can do. In Berlin, there's a lot of places where you walk past a column and you can press a button and then you'll get information about where you once uh, about the history of that place and what once happened there. And there's also some really great apps that you can walk through the city with and it will show you pictures of what places looked like during TDR times. Um, so you sort of played a little bit with that idea. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> uh, 12 years ago I started uh, playing with this idea of audio tours. Uh, uh, we did a tour, uh, a project called You Are Not Here. It was a tour of Gaza through the, through, through the streets of Tel Aviv. Um, we made a, two, a, a map, a tourist map of, uh, of Gaza, uh, and on the back of the map, we printed the streets of Tel Aviv. <clears throat> now, when you held the map to, to the light, you could see the streets of Tel Aviv through the streets of Gaza in one-to-one -one ratio. And let's say you want to visit the unknown soldier statue in the, in the heart of Gaza, you find the corresponding location in Tel Aviv, you actually go there, and um, 
you, get, you find a sticker in the street. Uh, the sticker had a telephone number and an extension. You call the telephone number, you enter the extension, and you get an audio tour uh, of that uh, corresponding location in Gaza, uh, written and narrated by Leila El Haddad, a Palestinian blogger, who chose, chose all, the, all of the locations and recorded them. And, and the project was, uh, was very well received, and, uh, and the most... Um, exciting feedback that I got about it is someone came to me after one of the tours and, and she said, you know, for me, um, I love Leila's stories and I love the way she, she narrates Gaza and she, she obviously loves Gaza a lot. Uh, but for me, the strongest part of the tour was when I was walking from one point to the other. Because then I was walking around uh, along the boulevard in Tel Aviv, and and from and I was trying to imagine all of the buildings being the buildings in Gaza and the people walking uh, across from me being uh, the the residents of Gaza. And and that was a, a transformative moment for for me in the tour. That that moment of of what I see with my with in my imagination, and, and and I said, okay, there's something here. I have to figure it out. And then you know, it was we started this project 2006, 2007, uh, and then smartphones came. And then you know, it's like everybody has uh, devices in their in their pockets. We don't need to make sure that the stickers are still in the street all all of the time. And um, and then a year ago, or so like a year and a half ago, I was um, invited to do a new project in Jerusalem, and I said, "Okay, great, let's do Yonat here in Jerusalem." And and I'm and I'm thinking, which city should I overlay over Jerusalem? And I'm thinking about it, and I'm like Jerusalem doesn't need another city overlaid on top of it. <laughs> Jerusalem is already is already a city on top of a city on top of a city, and it's like it's like the the levels of narratives that are fighting for existence in the city are just unbearable. It doesn't need another one. Um, but all of these narratives are based in the past. They're not... They're, they're, like, I lived in Jerusalem for a couple of years as a student, and then it felt like this, the past is kind of dragging you down. You can't even experience the, the present, let alone speak about the future, which is like super scary. Nobody, like if you just start speaking about the future in Jerusalem, it's like, ah. Uh, um, and, and, and then it was obvious, we need tours of the future, or rather than the futures in Jerusalem. And, and it cannot be one. It's not like in the case of you are not here, it has to be plural. So we, we turned to a group of uh, authors and invited them for a workshop um, where we used some techniques that I, uh, that I spoke about uh, uh, yesterday, like uh, for futures and, and backcasting, and, uh, and, and, and they created uh, speculations about, uh, about the future, about their own uh, like kind of different speculations. And um, I want to give you just two examples. Uh, there, we, we, had, uh, we, we have eight uh, tours. Um, one of them is by uh, Chagit, Chagit Kaysar, and uh, and she she the spot that she chose in the city is uh, the Daoud, Daoud Brothers uh, building. This is a, a very one of the unique cases where uh, Palestinians who had to flee in 1948 uh, managed to um, managed to uh, win their property back, um, and. And the, the building uh, came back to the ownership of its uh, original uh, inhabitants. So, so, so it, was a, it was a story, that, like a real story that, uh, that she wanted to tell, but then she, she kind of took it into the future and, and, and we're arriving at this building and, and the woman who, who lets us in is from, from that family. Um, that got a hold of the building, and, and, and now apparently the whole region has collapsed, and the building that has become something you run away from, is some, it becomes some, a place you run to, because it, it became a shelter. Um, also some, uh, some, uh, uh, some solo punk uh, motives there with kind of uh, uh, biodiversity uh, um, and kind of uh, maintaining seeds and stuff like that. And it's, uh, but, but, but there's something like a, a mix of uh, post-apocalyptic decay 
and then this hope in this one place. And, and I love, I love the, that story, but then it repeated the, that, that thing that, 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 you know, let's create great things after the apocalypse. And, 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 I, and I felt like, good, that's one future. Hopefully, we're going to get others. And, and another tour uh, was by a political organization uh, in, in based mainly um, a, a kind of an emerging uh, political organization called the Two States, One Homeland. They're actually going against the two-state solution that uh, has not been really proving itself. Uh, and they're saying, no, we don't need separation. We need to live together. We, we need to, to have two, gov two governments and we need to open borders. We need a, co uh, a confederation, basically, between Israel and Palestine. And, uh, and, and I was like, okay, <laughs> right. And, and, but, but then, I, I, from that framework of really challenging myself, I was like, yeah, like, let them, you know, how does it look like? And then the, the location that they chose is very interesting. They chose uh, the, the village of Silwan, the village of Silwan is a village in, the, in East Jerusalem, and it's very uh, contested because, because uh, there are settlers that are invading that village and are trying to, to push the, the residents out of, the, of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of that village. At the same time, there are also um, an um, archaeological project to, to kind of um, to, to study the history of uh, the city of David. Where it, it, it apparently historically that, that's where David's court, uh, King David's court, used to be, and uh, and it's a whole uh, settler project to to kind of argue for the history, for for, for our, our right, the, the Jewish right to the to the place. Now it's true apparently that that's part of the history of the place, but what the, while they're doing that, they're also wiping the Palestinian history of, the, of that place. In the future, that, that was proposed by the, by the founders of this, uh, two of the founders of, of this movement, the, this specific site is becoming a shared archeological site. And, and both Palestinian and Israeli archeologists are working on on finding the sh the different histories of that specific place. So what what was b beyond the fact that it's really exciting to to hear that and and like and you feel a bit guilty about enjoying it because because all of your defense systems are going like no no it can't happen and like no no I want it to happen but I want it to happen so let's figure out how to get there. And, um, and, and they're also not only looking at plural futures, they're also looking at plural pasts. So, uh, so, so there's something about placing that option of, uh, of uto utopia, and, and this is the most utopian of the eight tours, that is really um, um, powerful. It's a super interesting format I think you've developed. Before we discuss it a little bit and open the floor for your questions, I'd like to ask Maya. She's prepared a little intervention for us, and I think it's a great time to hear that. <laughs> Thanks. It's not really an in oh, sorry, it's not really an intervention. <laughs> I'm not going to make you do anything. Um, but, yeah. Let's see. It's actually just Intellectual like intervention. Yeah, it's just, it's just a presentation. It's a regular presentation. <laughs> I thought I'd give it a uh, cool this name. This be showing, actually. <laughs> it's not the presenter view, I think. Is it? Yeah. Could you have any embarrassing notes? Yeah, I hope not. So it's... Oh, really? Okay. So uh, actually, maybe I can just, okay, so maybe I'm going to not have my notes, it seems, but I think I will, I think I should be able to wing it. Um, maybe I will just go back to, can you just put it back on? You. And I'll tell you a little bit of the background to my uh, intervention or contribution to this discussion. So last year 
in um, when Republica had an event in Thessaloniki, Republica Thessaloniki, Mushan invited me to uh, do a little presentation with him, and um, he talked about some of the things that I think he presented here. And uh, I had just come back from something called the Planetary Future Summer School, which was actually run by Orit Halpern, who was also a keynote speaker here a few uh, days ago. And um, Orit is, uh, is, is a pedagogue, an academic, and, um, and a mentor of mine. And so the Planetary Future Summer School took place at Concordia University, and there were about 20 of us uh, PhD students who uh, looked at themes of extraction, colonialism, and speculation to ask about what does it mean to actually inhabit the catastrophe. And what happened in that time was I found myself uh, taking a lot of photographs, posting them on Instagram uh, wherever there was a connection, uh, because we were kind of in the rural north of Canada for a while at an open pit gold mine where you actually don't have internet connections. Um, and so we were encountering things like gold mines and waterways and thinking about our connection to the planet itself. So I was taking all of these photographs and then later I kind of put them together as a story uh, on Instagram and then I made that into a presentation that we, that we did in Thessaloniki. But uh, so this is, well, I, I didn't have enough time for the story here, but I thought I'd focus on this idea of exit. And this is particularly inspired by the work of Sarah Sharma, who is also an academic um, at the University of Toronto. And her work is really about uh, a, a feminist perspective on the idea of exit and the way that exit emerges in our narratives around speculation, utopia and dystopia. Uh, who gets to leave uh, and why do we want to leave? Who are the people with the capacity to leave? So, for example, we hear a lot about Elon Musk, um, you know, putting a car into space or wanting to terraform Mars, Google having its lunar X prize and, you know, um, wanting to mine the moon. Uh, there's even a film from 2011 called Another Earth. It's a really bad film, uh, but it's the, I, the, the, the plot in that film is about how there's actually another version of Earth out there. It's a complete replica, so it doesn't matter what you do here because we're going to go to another Earth anyway and we're going to start over there. Uh, so the, these sorts of ideas about starting over and ex exiting and going somewhere el else are actually inherently colonial because this is kind of what happened in a lot of colonial times as well. A lot of countries that eventually became colonial rulers and masters were facing situations of crisis and had to go somewhere else to, to, to shore up their economies and to develop more spaces, uh, to extract natural resources. Uh, so going to the moon is a little bit uh, colonial in that sense. And the story that I wrote from the Planetary Futures Summer School was about actually a scientist, a woman scientist who's elite and gets to go to the moon um, and work there and is ruminating on this idea of that, you know, why did she get to exit? Why did she get to go and be a colonialist and start over? Um, but felt good that the work she was doing on the moon was actually helping people back on Earth. Um, so the thing is, this is not so speculative, actually. Uh, the European Space Agency does have a Moon Village project. It's a very real thing. And they've been doing workshops with artists and architects and designers to try and imagine uh, how we might inhabit the moon, uh, but also talking to social scientists and humanity scholars and artists about how will we deal with society uh, on the moon. And this, it's almost as if um, none of us are looking at these questions now here on Earth and as if we have to deal with them for the first time again um, on the moon, um, except that there are actually, outer space and the moon is kind of legally, that there, there are black holes uh, and we don't know how to actually negotiate relationships in places like that. Um, so yeah, so the other thing that, uh, where I also see these ideas of exit and who gets to exit is in things like transhumanism um, or the idea that we can edit genetic code. So this idea of kind of escaping time, escaping the body because, and it's seen as hacking and hacking and it's kind of, I think hacking is a positive thing. Um, or the use of genetics, like I want to show you uh, something I read about CRISPR and CRISPR is gene editing technology. And this is a quote from Bill Gates writing in Foreign Affairs um, and so of course, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation has been doing a lot of work on malaria, not all of it very successful, but I found this paragraph really interesting. Um, so using sophisticated geospatial surveillance, computational modeling and simulation, all high-tech stuff, um, to then identify 
where mal uh, malaria outbreaks are, and then edit the genes of female mosquitoes, because these are the ones that transmit malaria, uh, and create mostly male offspring, which don't. And that's all great, and I think it would be awesome to eradicate disease, um, like malaria, diseases like malaria, except that we have to go back to kind of older questions about who controls this technology and what does it mean when you can go into a place and like change the ecosystem by just producing more male mosquitoes as a solution to a problem that it's not like people haven't been working on these problems. So these are kind of other ideas of how we might want to, to exit um, the problems that we face. And so recently I was um, in a presentation about work by Anna Singh, who's another wonderful academic and has worked closely with Donna Haraway. And uh, she's working on a new project at the University of Copenhagen that looks amazing and I'm looking forward to when it comes out. It's called the Feral Atlas. And I was hearing about it a few weeks ago and it's based on this idea that the, the, the planet and the climate that we inhabit is not uniformly bad. They are not uniformly experiencing devastation in the same way everywhere. And there are these, the, these effects that we've had uh, on our planet um, where there are patchy outbreaks of feralities. Ferality a word? Yeah, maybe. Of, of feralness, maybe. And the question they posed is, what happens if you... Um, what happens if you embrace the horror and you actually embrace the shock and... Um, one of the things that's in, uh, going to be part of that project is this, and many of you probably know this image. Uh, it's by Chris, the photographer Chris Jordan, and it's called Midway uh, Message from the Gyre. And it is a picture of an albatross, which he called Shedbird. Um, and, the, and this is what is in the albatross's stomach. And it kind of, it kind of uh, we have to face our effect on the planet through the picture of this bird. And so the Feral Atlas project asks, what happens if you actually stay with the horror and the shock uh, and you don't exit and you don't leave, what happens then? How do you face the, the propaganda, the disinformation, the shit and the violence? Um, how does your strategy change and what are your tactics? And I think a lot of the great projects people have been talking about here has been about doing the old boring mundane stuff of kind of finding ways to inspire ourselves to stay with the trouble. Um, and so I want to end with uh, two stories um, of a very different context um, about women in India and Pakistan who are actually dealing with conditions of restricted mobility and violence in their cities. So the first is girls at Dhabas. The a Dhaba is a, is a tea stall. And so um, this is a project out of Lahore and it's about women riding bicycles, hanging out in tea shops and drinking tea, which is the most mundane, boring activity if you're a man who already owns public space. But if you're a woman, what does it take to actually embrace that fear and that horror of saying, no, I'm just going to hang out and, you know, drink tea. Um, or there's Blank Noise from Bangalore, um, another wonderful group of people who they call themselves action heroes. And they do really mundane stuff like this, where it's very, if you've been to India, you know it's very common for men to just, first of all, occupy a lot of public space, but also do stuff like sleep in parks. And, you know, especially in a city like Bangalore, where you have amazing parks, it's one of the nicest things to do. But you are not going to be an Indian woman sleeping in a park in the middle of the day. That's just, that's too dangerous. So they encourage each other to actually just take naps in parks. And that's all you have to do. It's as simple as that. And I continue to go back to these kinds of examples where you have to kind of feel things and be new and different things uh, with and in your body, um, and basically not exit and just face the shock and horror. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. I want to open this up for questions from you guys. Can you do us a favor? And unless you're sitting in the first row, please come to the middle. Oh, no lights. All right, then. Never mind what I said. Pavel, would you like to go first? I think there's a microphone coming your way. Uh, so, uh, good morning, my name is Pavel. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you because I think that this is a really huge thing and we should be creating new vision for, for the future. 
and I wanted to ask exactly about that because uh, in the very first notes, notes towards a manifesto of solar punk, uh, it was stated that it should be movement for more than just the white west. And when I'm talking to people from outside of the uh, Euro outside of Europe, outside of the US. Uh, I find it that they still follow the dreams that they are sold uh, by the neoliberals, the transhumanism, the cyberpunk. And uh, I was actually talking to an Egyptian maker who is basically implementing all the solar punk ideas and he was openly stating that he wants to bring the cyberpunk future because for him this was the future. So my question is, how can we actually approach uh, people from different cultures, from Africa, both uh, North Africa and Middle East, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Asia, South America, how can we encourage them to create their own narratives uh, in the framework of, uh, uh, of solar punk, of sustainability, of working uh, cross-culturally uh, without giving up your own identity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, so the, the notes towards the manifesto, it's written by my friend Adam Flynn, and you should all go, go read it. But um, yeah, you're, you're totally right that this is a, a, a sort of a setup that's really meant to be a jumping off point for a lot of other types of futures that aren't just solar punk futures, but are indigenous futures and uh, Afro futures and um, disabled futures and, and uh, you know, much more, um, much more about trying to uh, give futures to people that have been erased from so many of the, the, the stories we're told um, about what, what, who's going to be on Mars and what their culture is going to be like. I mean, even things like Star Trek, which is notoriously, like, has a lot of diversity in it. it you know, there's lots of people that don't get to be in the 24th century. Um, so I, you know, myself just want, want to encourage people to go out and, and figure out how to um, tell the stories of, of people that previously didn't get to show up in a lot of the, those visions, so. I think uh, another answer is like what Maya just showed, like that picture of women sleeping in the park really looks similar. <laughs> To, to what Andrew was showing in his presentation. Like, apparently, there is something shared about like, what we value. Like, obviously, um, th th there's, and I argued that constantly about the, the, the need for plurality in, in, in the way we're thinking about futures, but there's also the need for, um, for um, mobilization and collaboration and and common ground uh, so 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 I, th I think i think there's room for these things to happen and they're not necessarily I, I, correct me if i'm wrong but i understand that solar punk did not start in in the like in the western world right it's a it's a it developed uh, Brazil was uh, was an initiator there and uh, and so on so i th i think we, we're channeling a lot of ideas through through stages like this one, which is not in Brazil, but the, but but this is not the or, the origin. We're just a channel, right? I I just think that people are are also kind of making their futures. It's maybe not about us. I don't know who us is. There is no uniform us, but just it's not about us taking or sharing those ideas. I think some of those narratives and practices may already be there, and it's a question of do they get uh, infrastructural or other kinds of support to sustain those things, and maybe the bigger question that I'm always left with at the end of these discussions is about scale, and what is our notion of something scaling for it to be successful. Maybe some things have to happen on a small local scale. A lot of ideas that we have of speculation are about landscape, huge uh, landslides of change, you know, and maybe it isn't always like that. And it's the small, boring stories that continue to happen that are significant. I'm sorry for those of you still raising your hands, but we've run out of time and I, 
Exactly, exactly, Mushan. I was just going to say, but you are still going to get another chance to ask your questions and meet these wonderful people who I've had the privilege to share this last hour on the panel with because, um, like I said, this is only the penultimate session in the Cancel the Apocalypse Trap. We have a meetup coming up and it's going to happen. What better place could we have wished for in the outer area of the makerspace? So if you follow all the way through the um, stage one hall to the back of our networking area and outside, and you see this black Fabmobile bus, which is also a little bit of a part of designing the future. They're going around to places which are sort of no jobs, dire, impoverished, and showing kids how to make cool stuff. And so we thought that was a great place to meet up for the, um, yeah, Cancel the Apocalypse meetup, where we'd like to meet with you guys who are out there designing these positive futures or just have more need to debate these topics and continue the discussion there. Thank you so much for coming and joining this panel. And thank you so much, Michonne, Andrew, Maya, Stevens. It was a great discussion. Thank you.